is a, a, an honor and a privilege for me to, to be here this morning and to present. Um, Snell, do you want to just advance? Uh, I'll hope to achieve the following things today. I'm going to introduce myself and the Blockchain Research Institute. Uh, I'd like to begin this discussion with a history of Bitcoin because I think as the mother of all blockchain technology, uh, having a solid understanding about the first use case of blockchain will help you understand all future applications. Um, it is a solid architecture, it's been around the longest, and I really feel that it's an important introduction to understand uh, the technology. I uh, want to talk further about consensus mechanisms in general, how blockchain um, works, uh, what the architecture is like, and why it's a unique technology, and discuss blockchain transformations, different use cases, how the technology is transforming government, businesses, and everyday lives for citizens, and hope to answer your questions. Perhaps we leave questions to the end, unless there's something that is really burning. Slide forward, thanks, Chanel. Uh, so me, Hillary Carter, um, I hail from Toronto, but I've put in my maiden name, which is McDonald, and I do that as a shout out to uh, our Cape Breton audience. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Alec McDonald, came from Judic, Cape Breton, and his ancestors arrived in Nova Scotia in 1790, and uh, he left the province to find work in Ontario where he, um, he worked on the Welland Canal that connects Lakes Erie and Ontario. So uh, this is actually my first time in Nova Scotia, so I'm actually delighted to be here. It sort of feels like I'm coming home. So a big shout out to everybody who's listening in, uh, in Cape Breton Island. My role at the BRI, I'm the Director of Research. I have hired the leading thinkers and subject matter experts in blockchain technology to conduct research reports, research projects that dive into the applications of the technology across um, all organizations, public sector and private sector. We're producing 75 different projects, of which 20 are individual case studies. Slide forward. So here are some of the ways we are examining technology, uh, this technology at the BRI. We're conducting an industry-specific um, analysis, what we call our industry verticals. And here we've got eight. I could add uh, transportation as an example of a ninth specific industry that, that we've actually um, moved on to cover because it's so relevant. Uh, it, it's incredible to see how the technology is applied beyond financial services. It's our first vertical. We have most of our research projects dedicated to blockchain applications and financial services, but that is um, in no way uh, an illustration of where blockchain begins and ends. What's really fascinating is to see how the technology is being leveraged in government, um, in voting, in retail, in manufacturing and healthcare, and what the opportunities are, and what, what the challenges are, and how um, disruptive and transformational the technology really is, and how pervasive it is. And no matter what your industry, this technology is going to be a part of your organization. Sooner or later, it will find a way in, because just as the internet came for publishing, um, the internet is coming for the, uh, banking and other industries. It will have a profound impact, perhaps in ways that the internet uh, did not. And another um, component of our program is to analyze how the technology will affect the individual functions of the firm, the specific roles of the C-suite. If you're a CEO, what does this technology mean to you? What sort of decisions do you have to make? Do you choose to stay on the sideline, sidelines and be an observer? Or do you choose to invest in um, a, the development of a proof of concept? Or do you wait and see if you join um, a consortium with perhaps your competitors? What do you do? And what are, the, what are the decisions that you need to make? These same uh, questions can be asked across all functions of the C-suite. How does blockchain affect the chief human resources officer? How does it affect the marketing officer? Um, and it does, and it will, and that's what's really exciting. So part of the benefit of our program is we've got, even if you, it, your organization was very specific uh, to one industry, there's a whole bucket of research that applies uh, to every function in your organization. Quite exciting. So 
So how did we get here? Well, taking a step back, I want to talk a little bit about the internet, what we call the internet of information. And in many ways, we are at a time reminiscent of the early 90s when the internet launched onto the scene and started uh, affecting the way we do business, uh, what my boss Don Tapscott calls a digital economy. And what did the internet do? The internet gave us open and instant access to information. And it transformed industries such as printing and publishing. It transformed Canada Post. And it devastated other industries. It devastated uh, the creative arts. I have a friend in a band whose music came out. And before they had released um, albums, songs had been leaked online. And he was playing to audiences who shouldn't otherwise have known the song, but they did. So it became very difficult as a creative artist to earn a living in the digital age. That's why artists are now playing live concerts all the time as, an only, as a way to earn um, a living. What the internet was unable to achieve was a secure mechanism for the transfer of value. The internet was great for sharing information, but what happens when I share a JPEG or um, an email? I'm not sharing the original. I'm sharing a copy. And that's terrific that everybody has a copy of the same thing, but that's really lousy when it comes to sharing assets. If I am sharing an asset across a digital channel, it's imperative that I still do not hold on to that asset. I can't have a copy of money if I'm trying to share it online. And that is where we move from the internet of information to what we call the internet of value. Slide forward. So the internet of value is the paradigm we find ourselves in uh, as a result of blockchain technology. This technology has allowed us to transfer assets online in a secure fashion. And it's not just money. We're, we're witnessing the transfer of other asset classes, contracts, deeds, property titles. Um, Votes are a possible use case. Works of art could be tokenized and embedded on this digital ledger and then transferred. All kinds of ownership, Car carbon credits, for example, um, and our own identities. What we've learned through uh, Facebook and, and producing data is that our identity and our activity is an asset, and it's a very valuable asset to an organization like Facebook. Uh, this is now, we're now in a time when we can increasingly own our own identities online when those identities are embedded on a blockchain. Slide forward. So what I'm going to do to help understand, um, or to try to help you have a better understanding of blockchain as a technology, it's important to, to go through a little bit of history about Bitcoin. How many, do we have any blockchain experts in the room? Does anyone own any kind of digital assets, any cryptocurrency? Oh, a few. Uh, OK, great. That's terrific. Uh, so Sunil, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, slide forward, because I have a few animations in the slide. So what we're going to talk about is what is Bitcoin and what is blockchain? Um, who created it? How does it work? Why was it created? And what are the applications of the underlying technology. What are the use cases beyond Bitcoin? And what has evolved since Bitcoin? That's the really important uh, concept for everybody to take away. So who created Bitcoin? Pseudonymous creator named Satoshi Nakamoto, whom we know nothing about. Um, he created it in, uh, he wrote the uh, Bitcoin white paper in the fall of 2009 called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. What Satoshi Nakamoto did that was really revolutionary is he put together technologies that had been in existence but hadn't combined them before. Cryptography, excuse me, had been around. Consensus mecha mechanisms have been around. But he put these components together and coded up uh, a platform which has completely changed everything in the sense that it created um, the technology capable of transferring assets digitally in a secure fashion. 
we also know that Satoshi Nakamoto has not touched any of, and I'm going to call him him, his Bitcoin. Uh, this uh, is an indicator that Satoshi's motives were not about making money, that they were about creating a mechanism for peer-to-peer -peer value exchange that did not involve an intermediary like a bank. And a peer-to-peer -peer system that was not governed by a central bank, had no shareholders, that was entirely community um, built and sustained. Uh, so uh, Satoshi's an incredibly wealthy individual <laughs> and um, really remains a mystery to this day. Um, there are a number of theories about who this person is, but what's more important is not who Satoshi could be, but why uh, he was motivated to create the technology. What is its purpose? <laughs> so why was it created? Well, um, a favorite expression of mine, uh, but it's not mine originally, it's Plato's, is necessity is the mother of all invention. There was a fundamental need to create a system, a value exchange, uh, without an intermediary. And these are the underlying um, necessities that I'll go through. So the first necessity is we have two and a half billion adults around the world who are not currently part of our global financial system. But the one thing that they do have, and in many places, is a mobile phone and access to the internet. And when we're able to harness the economic value that these individuals can bring, um, it will be an exciting uh, time to let more people participate in a global market and let the existing global market today participate with the people who are currently unbanked. So that was a problem to be solved and this technology helped solve that problem. The other need is that we do have an inefficient financial system. It works very well for many things, but in many ways it really doesn't work that well. I spent the first 10 years of my career in financial services. I worked at RBC, Dominion Securities, I worked at UBS, a Swiss bank, and I know the banking industry intimately. And I also know that there are uh, so many different pain points. And I'm gonna give you an example of a 2018 specific pain point and something we experienced at the Blockchain Research Institute. We have been unable to pay our US-based vendors with a US dollar denominated check drawn on a Canadian bank. It's 2018. Our bank has said this money is good. The money is in the bank. Please pay this person. We'll, we'll, we'll clear the we promise. We've cleared it. No, nope, we won't accept that. And so the inefficiency and the waste, when I get a phone call saying my bank's rejected your check, can you put out a stop payment? Can you find another way to pay me? It's a $45 wire transfer, and you've wasted my time and his time and, and our accounts payable department time. This is 2018. This is Canada to the United States. So imagine you're in Brazil and you're at Embraer and you're buying steel from China. That is a nightmare. International payments are a nightmare. It's not an efficient system because we don't trust each other. Trust is the fundamental issue that blockchain solves. You, you operate on a trustless network, making international payments incredibly efficient by this mechanism. So as much as there are many good things about our bank, the fact that if we forget our passwords, we can get them back, and we do enjoy a high degree of security, and, and it helps us solve our problems, uh, like when we make mistakes. Um, there are many, of, many inefficiencies and many uh, friction points, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of liquidity that's just locked up in the system. So we'll see where this technology can be applied in trade finance, for example, to free up some of that liquidity and get money moving a lot faster. And the, the final necessity was really the, the deep belief by many early Bitcoiners that the egregiences of the uh, financial system were, were just simply um, tough going. Uh, the corporate greed, CEO bonuses, um, hacks, fraud, that it was just a system that was feeding um, greed and it, near, it was perhaps hours from the whole collapse of the global financial system. The mortgage-backed security problem 
was a human-created problem fueled by greed, and the community said there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. So we know that or believe that Bitcoin was created um, on the winds of, of outrage uh, created by the financial crisis. And we know this because the Genesis block, the very first Bitcoin block that was created had this headline coded right in, Chancellor on the brink of third bailout for banks. That headline and the date in January, January 3rd, 2009, is part of the very first Bitcoin block. So there's your permanent record that there was that undertone of rejection of, of a financial system that um, had a lot of problems baked right into the, uh, baked right in. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first manifestation of blockchain technology. It's the very first cryptocurrency um, that came on the scene. It is a social construct. It's not a bunch of machines operating um, randomly. It wasn't an evolution. It was intentionally created based on the necessities that I have just covered. Um, it's fungible. It, like gold, it can be perfectly divided into smaller parts, unlike diamonds, which are not fungible because diamonds have different properties and they can't be equally divided. Um, it is a perfectly divisible unit of value exchange. It has a fixed supply. That's one of the very specific features of a, um, controlled supply whereby 12 and a half Bitcoin are minted, released into the system on average every 10 minutes. And there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. We have a circulation today of approximately 81%. That's how many Bitcoin have been released. And over the course of uh, the network, it will, it will reach 21 million. Bitcoin is a form of payment. It's an increasingly accepted form of payment by some, some big brands. Uh, Overstock is an online retailer in the United States. Virgin uh, Galactic is accepting Bitcoin. KFC Canada, you may, was the Bitcoin bucket here in Nova Scotia? Did you have the Bitcoin, or the, uh, online. yeah, online, you could order your KFC chicken and fries with the Bitcoin for a limited time. And it completely sold out, it was, it was gone. It was, wow, incredibly popular. And a, and a clever marketing move for KFC Canada. It's just a way for them to experiment, to see what was the reaction in the market, what was the response. It was a huge success. Uh, Xbox and Exp uh, Expedia, these are organizations that will accept cryptocurrency if you're gaming on Xbox. Um, Microsoft will let you pay for your in-app purchases using Bitcoin. Above all, Bitcoin is decentralized. There is no single uh, server. Uh, it is a decentralized network of uh, collaborators located all around the world. It, um, it's not backed by a government, it's not backed by a central bank, there's no board of directors, and there are no shareholders. It's a human sustained network. Anyone can go and uh, participate in the Bitcoin blockchain. You can download the software. Essentially, it is a software that you can download. You need a lot of uh, computer space to participate. Um, but anybody can be a part of this network. Uh, it's not exclusive, it's completely open. It's open source, uh, go and download and tinker if you're so inclined, I've not done it myself. But uh, yeah, that's what's exciting. It's open and available for everybody to participate if they wish to. And it really is a community. It's a community of stakeholders, the people who own Bitcoin, the people who sustain the network by validating the transactions, they're called miners. Uh, the people who, who develop applications, uh, uh, purchase, uh, point of sale systems that will allow uh, cryptocurrencies to be integrated into uh, uh, accounts payable or accounts receivable. Um, entrepreneurs who are, who are working in a number of different ways with Bitcoin, creating an exchange, for example, between your financial institution and, uh, and the cryptocurrency. And those who create uh, what, what are called hardware wallets, uh, these are tools which allow the safe storage of digital assets such as Bitcoin. So they're called wallets. 
and so like a USB drive. So those are the kinds of um, stakeholder groups that are really rallying around this technology, innovating on it, creating products, creating services, perhaps creating uh, a gift card where you could go to your local store, pick up a gift card off the rack, and scan it, and there, you've got your Bitcoin. So there are a number of ways that I foresee Bitcoin will be accessible to the market um, in the future. Thanks, Bill. So what is blockchain technology? Well, blockchain, and the, speaking specifically to the Bitcoin blockchain in this regard, is a fully transparent and decentralized software protocol designed for value exchange. Transparency, this is unique to what we call open and permissionless blockchains like Bitcoin. Any of us can go on at any given time and look at the transactions that are taking place right now on the Bitcoin blockchain. That's what we mean by radical transparency. And while the transactions are taking place, they don't have my name on it, but they, might ha but they will have my Bitcoin address. It's sort of the same thing as an email and a password. Um, it's like seeing all these transactions have an identifier of sorts. Uh, each identifier is unique to a certain participant. So we can see all the transactions that are taking place at any given time. What we're less able to do is to ascribe an identity to those specific transactions, to those addresses. That's a much more difficult challenge. And radical transparency, full transparency, is what makes Bitcoin and many open permissionless cryptocurrencies an extremely bad choice for nefarious activity. Uh, it has a terrible reputation for being the tool of criminals. Uh, if I were engaging in any kind of criminal activity, this is the last network that I would use because of full transparency. If at any time um, law enforcement professionals are able to uh, link my identity to transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, they have a perfect financial um, uh, and forensic record of all the activity. And on occasions where, where there have been um, some compromises to other cryptocurrencies, you can see the flow of the funds of the, the cryptocurrency from uh, the original account that might have been hacked to the hacker's address. It's a perfect financial record. So that's what radical transparency is. And that's specific to Bitcoin and public blockchains. And so enterprises have had to limit the amount of transparency when they take a blockchain application and bring it into their organizations. They need to make the technology more private to make it more functional. So it's also called DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology, and it, it's very much um, like an Excel spreadsheet. It's just one gigantic Excel spreadsheet in real time, and everyone is looking at the same spreadsheet in real time. It's not unlike Google, um, what's the Excel equivalent? Google Sheets, thank you. Uh, it's decentralized. Everybody participating in this network is, is located all around the world. There's no single point of failure. If I were to try to hack my way into Bitcoin, I would have to hack everyone's um, application simultaneously all around the world and the previous blocks uh, before. It's an incredibly challenging uh, system to compromise. Hasn't happened yet and uh, it's, not, uh, it's nine years old, but uh, I work with um, Tony Scott who's leading one of our projects at the Blockchain Research Institute on blockchain applications and government. And Tony Scott was President Obama's chief technology officer for two years. And he said that he has not seen any architecture, system ar architecture, that is as secure as the blockchain. There, there really is nothing that has been quite so effective at uh, being hack-proof thus far. Uh, so it's secured by high levels of computing power. It takes an awful lot of computing power to sustain this network, and that's one of the barriers of entry for anyone who wants to try to compromise it. You would need pretty much more computing power than a million Googles to try to take down the Bitcoin blockchain. It's, it's utterly, um, I mean, conceptually, I just simply don't know how it would be done. And that's a, that is uh, a barrier to entry. Um, 
sustaining the Bitcoin blockchain takes an awful lot of energy, and that's a barrier to entry. So if you want to hack this net network, come armed with big computers uh, <laughs> and more energy than the, than the planet Earth uh, generates. It's just not, not likely to happen. So as I've mentioned by the stakeholder community, this is a network that is, uh, blockchains are generally sustained by mass collaboration by players all around the world who are working together to validate the transactions, much in the way that a back office is a clearinghouse for financial institutions. Uh, blockchains have their own clearinghouse. They're called miners, and it's a decentralized community of validators who are all working together to compete for rewards in order to sustain the network. And I'll describe that a little bit more in detail. It solves the double spend problem. Uh, blockchains, for the first time, have created the tools necessary for me to transfer value digitally and not keep that value at the same time. I cannot spend cryptocurrency that I don't control. And once I send it, it's gone. I can't write a check and then you know take that money out of my bank. It just does not happen. The system will not let you spend uh, Bitcoin that you don't own. And that's what's interesting, and I think that brings us back to the global financial um, crisis. Finance is our ability to spend things that we don't have. Bitcoin eliminates that, and so it, it encourages <laughs> responsible spending. Um, that is the very specific uh, design choice built into the network. You cannot send Bitcoin that you don't control. Uh, so I've said it enables the exchange of, of any kind of digital asset uh, beyond currencies. Uh, these are the applications that go beyond Bitcoin. So other blockchains that have been created to enable us to transfer other types of asset classes, boats, uh, land titles, health data, and so on. So that's the, the, this is where we move from the first use case as a cryptocurrency to business applications that allow us to leverage the features of, of what the Bitcoin blockchain created, take those features and apply them to solving specific business problems or social problems. And the characteristics of blockchains, whether the Bitcoin blockchain or a private permissioned blockchain used by industry, is that they're secure, they're transparent to a degree, and they're immutable. Um, you can't reverse tra uh, transactions on a blockchain. So it's both a bug and a feature. There's no, uh, which bank? Uh, a bank just sent $35 billion in payment erroneously yesterday. I think it's Deutsche Bank. And luckily you can reverse that payment. And there was a comment made, well, what if that payment had been in Bitcoin? Whoops. So that's, that's dangerous and that's something that needs to be addressed. So we're early days in, in the coding out of these tools. We have to figure out a way to leverage the features but control for human error and control for um, emergencies and, and the unplanned. So Bitcoin's, it, it, you have to use it with great caution. Blockchains at their core are an incentive-driven technology. Uh, whereby self-interested actors, who are called miners, pursue private gain in order to maintain a public good. They have an economic incentive to participate in the Bitcoin blockchain by validating all of the transactions. And they use the Rubik's Cube example because it's solving the Rubik's Cube um, my son can do it, and he loves to do it, and he does it for no other reason than intrinsic motivation. That is his incentive. He loves to do it. He taught me how to do it. It's tough going, but <laughs> I did learn it, and that was my intrinsic motivation. Um, and logic can only take you so far in solving the Rubik's Cube. At a point in the cube, you have to apply algorithms. You have to apply um, a function in order to to solve that cube. And solving a block, solving a block of transactions on a blockchain is very similar. You have to apply a, a mathematical function, a cryptographic, you have to solve a cryptographic p 
puzzle. And in order to do that, it takes an awful lot of energy for which there has to be an offset of a very handsome incentive. So for validators to validate a block, which happens on average every 10 minutes, the reward for validating a, a block of Bitcoin transactions is 12 and a half Bitcoin. And at the price of $8,000 or so US per Bitcoin, that's a huge reward that's going to some mining community every 10 minutes. So that is the economic incentive that sustains the running of the Bitcoin blockchain. Private blockchains have to then create a similar incentive mechanism whereby all the players in the network have an incentive to play nice, to validate one another's transactions and to, to move the transactions along. So like a Rubik's Cube, we're solving uh, Bitcoin blocks. And instead of an intrinsic motivation doing it for fun, the mining community is doing it for an economic reward. This is what the mining community looks like. This is the distribution of miners all around the world. Uh, there are, uh, when was this? February, February or March, 12,297 nodes, what we call individuals who have downloaded the entire Bitcoin stack onto their computers, you call a node if you do that. And if you're participating in trying to validate those transactions, this is the distribution of the Bitcoin community. All of these individual uh, points in blue are competing for that 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes to try to solve the block and create a new block of transactions. So it is really a globally distributed clearinghouse, globally distributed back office. Uh, that is what the international Bitcoin community looks like on a map. So how does it work? A sends B money, I send Sunil some money from my phone. And that transaction where the digital currency is going from my account to Sunil's account is given an identification number, it's called a hash. That transaction of my sending Sunil some cryptocurrency is being broadcast. And it's being broadcast to everybody who was on that map. And our transaction is being collected up with all the other transactions that are taking place at the same time. So all the transactions that are taking place right now are collected into what we call a memory pool. The successful node, someone on that map, uh, validates the transactions by applying um, a, a cryptographic hash to try to solve a very challenging puzzle. And it's a random number. It's like winning the lottery. It's not very special. It just takes a ton of energy to solve it. Um, they apply what's called a random nonce to the memory pool to try to solve it. And the lucky winner will have the privilege of forming a new block and receiving 12 and a half Bitcoin. Um, and that's how the Bitcoin network is sustained. That's how blockchains are sustained. The new block is cryptographically linked to all the previous blocks. So the new block that's formed has a code from the previous block, and it has a, a code that um, uh, identifies it as a new block, and it takes all the various transactions and then it finally gets that winning um, validating number that validates the entire block. So. They're all cryptographically linked together. Each and every block in the chain is linked to the previous block, which is linked to the previous block by an identification number. And then the money settles. When that new block is formed, my transaction of sending crypto assets to Sunil is done. It's, comp it's validated and it's essentially settled. So this, this is the best thing that you can do for yourself to see how um, the Bitcoin blockchain functions. Um, this is not live, but if you go to a site called tradeblock.com, this is a screenshot from tradeblock.com, and this shows you a, vis this is a visual representation of how the Bitcoin blockchain functions. So 
let's assume that this is the uh, transaction whereby I sent some, some Bitcoin to Sunil. And we sent it at this time, it was $25, or 25 Bitcoin. Um, our transaction is given a hash, and this section of the latest transactions, these are the latest transactions that are taking place over the network right now. And they're all gathered together in this area here, which is called the memory pool. This is the block that all of those miners all around the world are competing to validate. And when they do, a new block is formed. Uh, this block is block number 477438. And this is the block before it and the block before that. And it just simply shows you that this is a live, fast moving and very real, very transparent ledger. You can click on any one of these transactions and have a look at how small the amounts are that are being exchanged across the Bitcoin network right now and how <laughs> large some of the transactions are. It's really fascinating. It's a great hands-on tool that you can explore and look around and see, oh, that's interesting. And this, oh, that mining organization solved that block. We're not sure who, so who solved that particular block. Um, but it just simply shows you a live representation of the blockchain in action. So I would encourage you to go on. If you find that some of these squares are really small, um, what that indicates is that the blocks are being solved a lot faster than every 10 minutes, um, and that the complexity of the problem needs to change in order to keep the Bitcoin minting on a precise schedule. Uh, so I do encourage you all to go on tradeblock.com for five or 10 minutes and poke around. You'll find it a, an enlightening experience if you do. So what's the difference between blockchains and databases? Uh, both are used to maintain uh, transactions and, and records. Uh, databases are generally centralized, they're on a single server and they're suitable for probably most of uh, our, our record keeping and, and many applications, but they do have limitations and that they can be compromised, they can be hacked. And we find time and time again that organizations and their central servers, like Equifax, um, are subject to compromise. That is the, the number one security risk with the database. Blockchains, on the other hand, being decentralized, are not subject to the same uh, single point of failure. Uh, they're, they are, it has been proven <laughs> that they're simply not um, hackable, and why they're so ideal for transferring money, transferring value. So let's move to blockchain transformations. How is this technology relevant to our organizations? How is it relevant to government? And can, why and how is it relevant to strengthening perhaps uh, the dem democratic process and democratic institutions? What are the features that will allow for better, cheaper government, um, higher levels of democracy and, and uh, legitimacy in government, and solving enterprise problems? So one of the greatest opportunities for governments is to create better, cheaper government, have higher levels of efficiency uh, in government institutions and radical transparency in expenditure. Imagine having a window into um, the registries of the, the government accounts. That raises accountability. If we can see where the, where the funds went, uh, that's a rather reassuring thing and to have uh, citizens have access to uh, expenditure data of any kind would likely have the trickle-down effect of, of uh, strengthening faith in our, our government institutions. Governments around the world are experimenting with blockchain technology by registering land titles on a blockchain ledger, an architecture leveraging the features of Bitcoin blockchain, which is secure and transparent and uh, a mechanism whereby a piece of land can be sent to uh, another party on that network just as easily as I could send Sunil Bitcoin, I could transfer other types of asset classes. 
So the government of Georgia, Sweden is moving to a land registry system. Uh, Dubai wants to have all governments on uh, all government documentation on a blockchain by 2020. They've, um, they've uh, I know the person who did the Dubai blockchain strategy, and uh, it's very intentional. Um, uh, the Canadian government is doing lots of exciting things as well, which I'll be happy to tell you about. What are we doing in Canada? Well, one of the projects that we're researching at the Blockchain Research Institute is um, focusing on how the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency is leveraging blockchain technology to secure the safety of Canada's food, its plants, and its animals. Um, I'll give you an example of how such a system would work. So let's take uh, fisheries, for example. How can the fish supply chain benefit from this technology? So the first thing that happens is the fish are caught and they're tagged. The lot is tagged. Um, the tag is enabled with IoT sensors and it's transmitting when the fish was caught, when it's tagged, and where it is on its journey from uh, along every stage of the supply chain. So after it's caught, Sensors are continually transmitting the data um, about the location. The sensors can also transmit data about the temperature of the container, um, how long it sat in, in a yard, uh, all kinds of information about the journey of any given product. All the distribution points. Did the regulators visit the plant? Was it cleaned on what day? How long had it been since there was um, some kind of, of check on the product? Um, and then once that product is ready for consumers, we will have the ability through our phone to simply scan a product and find out its entire provenance, that this fish actually came from these waters. Um, so what, what the Canadian Food Inspection Agency wants to do is, is understand the applications of blockchain to secure food safety, to build trust, excuse me, from Canadians in the quality of our food. Uh, if you look at the cannabis industry right now, to certify that strains of cannabis are indeed, um, uh, they're, they're pure and that they, their origins are uh, coming from where they should be coming from. It has huge applications in pharmaceuticals, anywhere where there's fraud. Um, this is a terrific application of blockchain technology. And it's simply leveraging uh, the immutability of the architecture, of the immutability of the software, the transparency of the software, and the fact that it is irreversible. Once a, a, a data point is embedded on a blockchain, it's there forever. You cannot tamper with it. You cannot manipulate it. And that's really important when it comes to health and safety records. Having that immutable ledger that everyone has access to is really quite a revolutionary notion. We haven't had that ability today. What else is uh, Canada doing? Well, um, one of the other cases that we're exploring is uh, related to business licensing. In Toronto, for example, if I were to open a restaurant, I have to fill out 65 different applications, permits, licenses, and so on. And what's incredibly frustrating is that the information that I fill out on those applications is generally the same information. And it's incredibly wasteful. The time to approval of that information can take months. And what we have is a situation where entrepreneurs are not getting down to the business of being entrepreneurs. They're bogged down by red tape and administration, and it's incredibly wasteful. That's the kind of waste that we're trying to unlock and, and um, the value that this technology can infuse into our economies, freeing up people from um, repetitive, wasteful activities, streamlining processes to make simple things simple again. Uh, so what the technology has uh, done in this case is streamline um, the process whereby the restaurant owner fills out one application and that application data is then transmitted to all the various parties and this was run um, by Deloitte and IBM 
and they had a very successful um, uh, a proof of concept rollout. Now the question is, how do you govern something like that? Once you've got a successful blockchain application, now what? Do we have to change the law? Who manages it? How do we roll this out? Um, so Canada is really examining the various ways that we can use uh, this technology and the efficiencies that it brings. In terms of strengthening democratic institutions, I think we're, we find ourselves in a time of fake news um, and low voter turnout and lack of interest in the democratic process and democracy the world over is under threat. Uh, and we are looking at ways that the features of the technology of blockchain, how it can strengthen um, trust. Donald Trump was elected on what we now know to be um, reels of fake news, uh, compromised Facebook accounts, uh, manipulation, and um, uh, we're in a time where it's very difficult to verify uh, the sources of our information. When we're getting most information from social media and social media channels are obfuscating the truth um, and we're only receiving information that the social media networks think we want to hear, and Google's no different, um, we find ourselves in an era where the truth is increasingly hard to come by. And in the case of Brexit, um, we know that the the people in the regions of the UK who voted to leave voted on lies. That they were, th the regions who voted to leave uh, the European Union were in fact those who derived the greatest amount of benefit from it. But the political process was, uh, had an agenda and fake news and alternative facts are the order of the day. And so this is where we find ourselves and I think uh, uh, a number of people who are innovating in this community want to restore legitimacy and they want to restore accountability. And we want to get the truth back. And so we're hopeful that certain features of blockchain will allow us to do this and allow people to come out to the polls knowing that, oh, don't vote, it only encourages them. No, let's really vote for uh, someone who, who is giving us facts and uh, if we can have higher levels of accountability, then that's great.